I envy, I envy you. Everyone looks great. Welcome. Welcome to our Herb and Adaptogens for Stress Management panel. We're going to go for about an hour and a half. We've got a ton of questions and we've got some speakers that pack a punch. Uh, I'm joined here today with Dr. Karen Becker, Dr. Rochelle Wilcox, who's going to touch on our, nat or, I'm sorry, our human aspect. Debbie Gwynn's here from Glacier Peak Holistics and canine herbalist Rita Hogan. Thank you ladies so much for joining us. We My are pleasure. ready to go and so excited. Um, so we've got, we've got three core questions that kind of revolve around the theme of the event. And I'd like to start with those and we can talk about how herbs and adaptogens can help pets stress and ourselves, or I'm sorry, pets and ourselves decrease the, the stress levels that we're all experiencing. The first question is, Rita, I'm going to start with you. Our okay. animals, our animals are feeling confined, they're feeling trapped, and they're starting to take on the energy of the humans in the household. Um, how can, how can we help with, with herbs and adaptogens? Um, well, uh, one of the ones that I love the most for, um, like taking on the emotions of your owner, of, of you know, of your caregiver, um, is uh, called um, ficus, which is a fig uh, gemotherapy, therapy. And it's really good for those psychosomatic disorders, like psychosomatic um, kind of like symptoms that dogs will give off. Um, for anyone that's working with, with dogs, you know, you, you always kind of have to see what's going on with the, the people. Uh, you know, like, oh, I wonder what's going on in the household. And a lot of, like, I have been so busy since this whole thing started um, with a lot of dog, people that are really worried about their dogs being so needy and clingy mm -hmm. and just following them around the house and are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? Um, really love fig gemmal therapy for that. Um, it has that, it works on like that, that uh, nervous system in the gut and it, it helps regulate the nervous system. And I like it, I like to combine it with a uh, gorse flower essence. Uh, which is also good for when uh, when emotions are feeding off of each other. Um, and there's another flower essence uh, called horse chestnut, which is also good for uh, taking on all those emotions from from like feeding off of each other, your dog and you're feeding off of each other. So I really like those um, to begin with because I think that this is really a time when for me, like we look at all the herbs and all the things that are in our toolbox because like flower essences are just wonderful for everything that's going on right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Debbie, can you add to that? Um, you know, she's exactly right. And part of the problem with the animals is not that they're stressed. It's that we're stressed and we're sending off all that vibration of, Oh, I'm stressed. So you, so, so it's gotta go somewhere. And so it, it lands on the animals, whether they're horses or dogs or cats or whatever. They're getting it and they don't understand it. They have no idea where it's coming from. They don't know why you're stressed and they don't know why they're supposed to be stressed. But because you are, they are. And flower essences are incredible for that. Mm -hmm. But getting back mm -hmm. to the gut, gut health, like you said, Rita, that's, it, it's major, major. I mean, if they're not stressed out in their gut, then it, it's, it's easier for them to kind of assimilate into the routine of what's going on right now. But we really need to check our, our energy as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to use flower essences for your animals, please use them on yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Dr. Becker, what do you think? I, am, I, I agree with both uh, excellent sources of advice. I think that flower essences are amazing, especially if you don't necessarily have a, a anything physical going on, but you can just tell that your animal is um, acting differently. I think especially with cats, they're so good at hiding anxiety, stress, tension, that oftentimes we don't necessarily pick up on kitties and having a stress response because they don't necessarily manifest it as overtly as other species. So mm -hmm. I just I was just looking here at... Um, my collection, I just buy pre-made because I am too busy, um, but I have Scaredy Cats, Safe Space for Cats, and Peacemaker, and you are so right. I just 
yeah, of course, you've got a cat in the room, but I just like put it on like perfume mm -hmm. because if, if I can remain um, at a place of being grounded and healthy, then I'm a better advocate and a better leader for a bit better social group, a better mama for mm -hmm. everything in my home and for my mm -hmm. animals, because I travel so much. And because now I've been here three months, the animals are like, <laughs> what are you what are you doing here and how long is this gonna last so initially after the honeymoon period of yay you know we're all together and of course it was stressful because my entire as everyone our years our, our year has just been flipped upside down for a multitude of reasons but now that I have the animals into a nice pace of balancing stress and intentionally doing things to keep everyone in the home grounded now I'm starting my reparative preemptive proactive plan because I know life is going to start again. And I think that sometimes we just now are in a place, maybe those of us have been working really hard to keep things at a balanced level. Now we have to work at restarting life and introducing our crazy schedules back into our animals' lives. And maybe, you know, maybe Dr. Wilcox could talk a little bit about um, how, how we as things we can maybe nourish ourselves with as people that would help decrease our or, or adaptogenic herbs that we could take as people that would help decrease our cortisol. Because I know that there are foods that would be really good for us to minimize our cortisol production and help keep us at a place of balance. And if, if we can stay there, we can help role model that for our animals. Um, yeah, from a human perspective, there's uh, many adaptogenic herbs. Adaptogenic herbs are um, some of my favorite herbs to uh, prescribe and practice, they're a lot of fun, and that's because they're so effective and they're so helpful for people. Um, and, and so when, when looking at what adaptogenic herbs you can use as humans to help to mitigate stress, um, there's sort of two aspects that I would consider. The first would be if, um, in terms of your stress response, you want to know that your stress response is occurring from your adrenal glands, which are producing cortisol. Um, and so the idea, I think of your adrenal glands like basically your gas tank. And so if your gas tank is full of good food, good breathing, good movement, good sleep, good air, good thoughts, good feelings, then you know your gas tank is going to be full and you can get done what you, got, what you have to get done. Um, as we all know as human beings, <laughs> all of those things aren't perfect all the time. So, uh, you know, looking at all aspects of, of stress and saying, okay, where, where do I go and how do I fill up my tank? And so there are certain herbs you can do that help to fill up your tank to give you that energy, that gas to keep going. And then there are other herbs that you can take that will patch your gas tank, so to speak. So mm -hmm. if you're taking something, if you're trying to fill up your gas tank, but you're kind of still poking holes underneath there and letting it all drain out, then you're not really going to get anywhere. Um, so, I mean, I could talk forever about, about astrogenic herbs, but my favorite, my, one of my favorite go-tos is, is rhodiola. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fantastic herb. It has a natural ability to kind of increase serotonin, so it also improves mood while still being okay to take with medications like SSRIs and things like that. Um, it also has this natural ability, like any adaptogenic herb, to help you feel like you can cope with stress better, that you're less overwhelmed, that you can deal with day-to-day -day activities uh, and stressors, um, no matter how minimal they are. Uh, and one of the main indications you would, you would even know that you need an adrenal support uh, or an adaptogenic herb in any way is just if you feel like you can't cope, you know, if it's too mm -hmm. much, if you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, and then another herb I would say to use to kind of help patch, patch the gas tank, um, well, there's lots. Uh, I love uh, motherwort's a really good one, passion mm -hmm. flower. Um, and these herbs help to, motherwort's a really great one for opening your heart. So it supports like basically any kind of like heart palpitations, any kind of, if, you're, if your heart starts racing, if you get anxious, motherwort's really nice for calming that down. So is passion flower. Um, and these aren't so much that they're filling your gas tank. They're not really giving you that oomph, but they're giving that calming effect that's helping you carry on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. Awesome. Dr. Becker, I'm going to start with you here for the next question. Erin um, wrote in and she asked, how can I protect my dog from toxic disinfectants? Um, mm. She does agility and is concerned with the, the toxic load um, that everyone's experiencing right now because we're, some of us are using things like Lysol and, and the hand sanitizer and 
you know, we're using it a, a lot more than we ever were. Can you touch on that? Yeah. And I think that this is, again, this is an important One Health concept initiative that we need to be thinking about, even though, you know, we have, we have twofold issue. We have toxins outside the home. So yes, the entire earth is being, especially at this point, filled with disinfectants. And of course, when you go back to agility training or when you're out and about with your dogs, the exposure risk is very, very high. So because we can't control other people's chemical use, when we come back from known environments, even veterinary clinics, agility rings, doggy daycares, where we know that, that the chemical use has been incredibly high, we can do some reparative things like dunk those, just rinsing those paws off, you know, a hose in the backyard, really easy peasy. If you have a small dog, you can pop them in the kitchen sink and just hose off their feet. But literally rinsing these toxins and chemicals off of your dog's body and your body is a great idea. I am barefoot all the time. I live in a green home, but when I am out and about, when I come in, same thing, you know, we do things to minimize the chemicals that we may have swiffered outside. Um, by just rinsing those off our bodies. So when you come back from agility, yes, manually removing the chemicals that your dog may have swiffered up is a great idea, but you can also do oral internal de detoxification with herbs like milk thistle or dandelion. And dandelion now, depending on what part of the country you live in, you could just harvest dandelion as long as it's spray free from your yard. You can incorporate some natural free things from your environment that actually assist in that phase one and phase two liver detoxification. But when it comes to, so those are outside toxins that we don't have control over. When it comes to inside our homes, I would encourage you to pick and choose your disinfectants wisely. So in my situation, um, I use a medical grade uh, colloidal silver. It is, the website is called purebio.com and it, it's approved, it kills MRSA, it kills every possible virus, it kills everything, but it's colloidal silver. So it's completely safe. If God forbid, I mean, I know when I use this on my counters, I know my kitties are gonna walk through it and I know that they're gonna lick their paws. So I disinfect my whole home with safe medical grade colloidal silver because I want the disinfecting aspects without the potential toxicosis of using heavier or stronger chemicals. So I think modifying what you're doing in your home to be non-toxic but yet effective, and then doing damage control after you come in from a toxic world is a twofold strategy that can help minimize toxins accumulating in your pet's bodies. Awesome. Rita, do you have anything to add? I know you're a big fan of dandelion. How can we, how can we help stop the, the toxic load that is very obviously happening right now? Um, well, I definitely agree with Dr. Becker in, you know, the external, you know, getting, they just soak up everything with their, you know, their four on the floor, um, definitely cleaning that off, um, rinsing it off. And, and I know that sometimes it's a pain, but right now with all of these, you know, using all these chemicals and people are getting crazy with the Lysol. And when you yeah. read Lysol in the back of the Lysol, it's hazardous to humans and animals. So, it, it, you know, getting that off is important. On the inside, um, you definitely uh, want to work with the lymphatic system um, to, because, you know, you don't want to trap toxins inside the body, which, um, you know, can lead to lipomas. Um, but, you know, milk thistle, I agree with. Uh, dandelion is good, although you have to remember that it's very drying. Um, uh, dandel dandelion root. Um, and uh, I really like uh, juniper and mountain pine uh, gemotherapy for getting um, toxins out of the body very quickly without trapping them because those uh, two remedies help open up the elimination channels. So I do like those a lot. Um, and you can use them fairly easily for, you know, probably six to eight weeks at a time. That's great. Thanks, Rita. You're Dad, welcome. do you have anything to add? Um, I do. Actually, all those are great, um, great therapies. I think I would add to it um, clinoptolite, which is a purified, uh, micronized form of zeolite, which actually act, works like a magnet, and it can get through the system. So whatever they do ingest, whatever they, you know, where they lick on somebody, they lick something, and, they, and they've got it in their system, it can, it can take it out in six to eight hours. But it, it, they're shaped like a honeycomb. And so it, it's they mag because the, the the polar the polar opposites you know one's one's positively charged one's negatively charged and they it grabs a hold of them and it actually takes them out of the of the, of the entire system and the, the longer that you're on that, that these animals even I take it every day um, it's the longer you're on it the more 
the faster you are able to detox because it, it can get into the blood system and actually start to clean the blood as well. Um, I, would, I would probably add to that nettles. Nettles is also really good for cleaning um, the kidney, and so any and which helps with the lymph system as well. Um, and so I guess that's, other than what you guys have already said, that's, that's what I would add. That's a, that's a great arsenal. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Dr. Wilcox, what can we do for ourselves when it comes to being concerned about toxic load and, you know, being overly, overly exposed to sanitizers? Um, I think these ladies hit on a lot of the herbs. I know this is a herbal session. So um, yeah, the, the big ones that um, I would generally do, I think kind of to add to what they're saying, I mean, milk thistle is great, burdock is great, nettle, dandelion. Um, cleavers is another favorite of mine um, mm -hmm. for the system and for the ur uh, urinary bladder and kidneys. Um, what else would I do? Those are, um, I mean, you could also look at, you know, herbs that are supporting just in general. Um, uh, well, and the thing about giving, there are some adaptogenic herbs. Um, and by the way, I saw somebody did ask a question about what an adaptogen is. Um, so just for the record, uh, it's a substance that you can use that will increase your body's resistance to stress physically, mentally, emotionally, what have you. Um, and so it helps you to cope with stress essentially. And uh, yeah, so in terms of, you know, if you're looking at different um, adaptogenic herbs that are going to help maybe to support, like to relax you. So it's going to help put you more in that parasympathetic state so that you can digest better, so that you can process and detox better. Um, you know, great herbs that are also going to do that are like chamomile is great because it's got a really nice soothing effect quality to it and nervine quality to it, but it's also helping to aid in digestion and aiding the liver. Um, and licorice is another one. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for just like gastritis or any like ulcers like uh -huh. any stress condition with the digestive system it's really helpful for awesome uh that's that's a perfect segue into our next question that i had for debbie um and and we could talk about other animals too but debbie specifically related to horses are there specific herbs or adaptogens that can help us bring peace calm and comfort to our horses um, well, horses are a whole different breed species as they, they, because they don't live in our homes, they don't actually absorb our energy. But I have one quick little story. I, I helped um, put together a Qigong workshop several years ago and we brought in two masters of Qigong from China. And the minute I met the old man, I mean, and he, he was, he was elderly at the time and he's since gone, but first thing he said to me was you energy too hot. Mm. And I went, Whoa, okay. And so he told, and then as, as I, as I was explaining and, you know, doing things, what he explained to me was when you, when you feel like your energy is too hot, you energetically put it into the ground because the earth knows what to do with it. It can regenerate it, it can transmute it into something wonderful, but it gets out of you. And what I have found with horses is because, and Rodney was saying last night that, you know, dogs can smell stress on you after, if you've had a stressful day, but you're over it, but it still stays on your skin or it stays in your clothes. Horses actually have a 20 foot radius of feel and energy because they are prey animals. So typically when a horse or any prey animal, even a deer, if you startle them, they will run 20 feet and turn around and look at you to find out what it was that scared them. But if you walk out, and I have this personally with mostly mares for me, if I have had a really stressful day trying to juggle too many balls in the air, and I, all I want to do is go for a ride and get in the woods, I would walk out to the pasture and my mare would look at me and go, oh, oh no not going there and she would turn around and walk the other way my geldings not so much they would go it's okay mom we see we understand we'll go so i would you know any one of them would pick you know say yeah we're in but the mares no so when i learned this trick when i would walk outside and i would check my energy and if i would feel it's too hot i would drive some of it down into the earth i walk out and my mare would go oh yeah i'll go and she was a rock star. I mean, she was a, she was a she was a woods, forest, 
every animal in the pl on the planet that she would come across, she was like solid as a rock and just like, yeah, no big deal. Mom's not scared. I won't be scared. But that was that was that's a huge thing, and you can actually do that before you walk into the house. If you've had a really stressful day at work, check your energy, drive it into the earth, and get rid of it. Um, so I guess beyond that, energetically speaking, I let my horses do my lawn for me, which is basically all dandelions, and they do a beautiful job. They weedy, <laughs> they get all the way up to the shrubs, but they take down all the. They do a beautiful job. Um, when I have like a, I have one here right now that is a little bit stressed out about I don't know what. She stood and ate a whole comfrey plant this morning. Mm. She and that's what she does. You know, when she's when she's got something going on, she'll 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 find a comfrey plant, and I've got them all over the farm, and she'll eat the whole thing. So they they self medicate. It's allowed. Oh shoot! I muted myself. There's someone here in the chat asking, "How do we drive our heat into the earth?" Well, don't think of it as heat, number one. Think of it as energy. And it, co it, it can come right straight out of the tip of your fingers. So you just pound, point to the earth and with intention, drive it in. I mean, if you've got a lot, I actually sometimes use all five. But if it's just, you know, it, you just check. And everybody's different. And if you can actually get in tune with who you are and where your normal is versus where am I right now? Am I good? Am I too high? Am I too low? What do I need? And then your animals can actually use what that and, and they'll balance off of you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Deb. Our, just one note on that. Our, you know, as, as humans, our electricity, our cells run on electricity. And so they're mm -hmm. at about 90 millivolts. And if you think about electricity, it needs to ground. Uh -huh. so we need to ground because we're electrical beings. So bare feet on the earth as much as you can. Get barefoot. Get but not around horses. Get not around <laughs> horses. Don't get barefoot. Don't get barefoot. <laughs> you know, you know, just, just one thing I was thinking. Um, I sometimes have had clients say to me, you know, you talk a lot about energy and grounding out, and that's all cool or meditating, but I can't meditate. My, I just can't go there. Um, EFT, emotional freedom technique, is a nice... If you're kind of a wound tight type A, never going to meditate kind of girl or a guy, you learning about EFT or tapping is one way to shift your, shift your cellular energy without mm -hmm. having to like focus or meditate or do anything that maybe you haven't, you don't have those skills in your toolbox or you don't want those skills in your toolbox. What, what are your thoughts, Dr. Wilcox, about EFT? I love EFT. <laughs> um, I find I, I prescribe it a lot. And I, I would say probably like 90% of people would um, have like reap benefits from it. It's not for everybody. Um, but yeah. I think mostly if you're, if you're doing it correctly, it really gives you the sense of because most of what's going on with stress, we have what we know consciously, but then we have our unconscious, which is yeah. harboring all these thoughts and feelings through and gathering all this energy throughout the day. And so tapping is something that's a really great way of one, you know, you're tapping on certain meridian points, right? Um, two, it kind of, it's bringing into you a bit of like an active meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and three, you're actually saying a phrase, an affirmation about something. Um, and then it, what it also does is really give you space and a moment to process and allow things to come in and have yeah. realization. So you could be tapping at this. One of the examples I always give is I had a patient one day wake up with extreme anxiety in the morning. And so she sat there and she tapped and you can just be very, you know, uh, uh, not non-specific. She was very general and just said, I, I wake up in the morning with anxiety, even though I'm waking up with anxiety, I love and respect myself. And as she repeated this phrase, she realized that she had actually had a dream that night that somebody that she loved mm -hmm. passed way and she mm. said that she probably wouldn't have realized that if she just got up got ready went to work and started her day and just went full tilt mm -hmm. um but taking it took her i think she said under 10 minutes to tap wow. and then her anxiety went from a nine out of ten to a two out of ten just like that incredible fantastic oh wow that's great and it's eft is the what it's called 
Yeah. Yep. Emotional freedom technique. Yeah. Thank you. And it's what it's just a good place to start. Like if, if those of listeners that are like, what are they talking about? Um, that's a nice place to start that kind of coaches you through converting your fight or flight, your, your, you know, your sympathetic amped up into more of a calming, I got this. And, you know, in these weird circumstances, when we can't necessarily change any of the circumstances about our earth right now, the only option we have for change is changing the terrain of ourselves. And that real mm -hmm. that Dr. Wilcox, you know, we all have a real in our brains. That reel is either telling us to panic and have fear or maybe self-loathing or derogatory statements about ourselves. And most of us don't even know what that tape is playing. But EFT provides a nice way to convert a stress response into a non-stress response. If you, don't, if, if you have no idea what to do, this is a great option as a beginner step-in tool. And like Dr. Wilcott said, it's not for everyone, but it's a nice place to start if you don't know where to start. Awesome. And just, just as a just a quick little note, there's a book called The Topping Solution that explains it all. And then you can also go to um, uh, www.eft.mercola.com, and it just it just gives you lots of videos and information on it. Awesome. I just put that into the chat for everyone. Thank you. That's that's a new one for me. I'll be trying that myself. Rita. Yes. Are there any herbs? <laughs> are there any herbs that we give our give to our dogs that are not safe for cats? I am so... not a cat. That would be Dr. Becker. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't work with cats, and That's I think right. lots of herbs are completely cat friendly. But there are some that mm -hmm. are not cat friendly, and I think that Karen could answer that or Deb uh, a lot easier than me. I, yeah, I'm I, only a dog girl. I'm not quite sure why I asked the canine herbalist. The cat yeah, I, I, I'm really, I, I really do draw that line. It's like, I don't work with kitties and um, I, I would love someone to be a specific kitty herbalist, but um, no. so complicated. Karen and Deb, you got this. Well, Karen, go. I, I will say this, I will say, the the superstars of the adaptogenic herbs and there again as dr as dr wilcox wilcox pointed out there are herbs for acute there are adaptogenic substances for uh, acute stress or this alarm phase and then the uh maintenance or the resilience phase where you're chucking a ton of cortisol but you're feeling great because you're kind of zinging on stress hormones and then the exhaustion phase where your adrenals and our pets adrenals just can't keep up there are different adaptogenic substances for each one of those phases but the rock stars in my book, which would be ashwagandha, tulsi, rhodiola, L-theanine, like those are the big herbs that have been studied on rats, mice, dogs, cats, and humans. Those herbs that have been well-researched for cats and dogs, I feel completely safe using them in both of those species because we have research demonstrating safety and, and, and efficacy. Now, Within those, my, my superstar adaptogenic herbs that are kind of my go-to. In fact, when I just look, as you, as, as most people know, I'm a crazy tea head. I just look over, like I look at all, I just have like Tulsi Tranquility and Serenity. Now all of these herbal blends, so these are um, David's organic teas, but the organic teas are really a gr uh, herbal, organic, caffeine-free teas that are made for stress for humans. They're all completely safe for cats. And that's a really nice, gentle way to get you know chamomile hops valerian you can make those herbal teas that you can buy for yourself let them cool and you can soften up your kitty's kibble or you can mix it in with a little bone broth and add a little topper to dry food or you can easily sneak these herbal adaptogenic trees into canned food just add a teaspoon you know into your kitty's food tea is such a great way to administer gentle low dose herbs to kitties and most of the time kitties don't mind it and they accept it you know with cats we have to trick them into everything we don't say are you interested in eating an adaptogenic herb because cats are like no no i'm not so it's all about trickery and because kitties are psychic anyway like they'll just see you over there kind of beside their bowl and they're like she's doing something I mean, they just know. but as as julie and lee just talked about in our previous session you know if you approach this with intention and say listen i'm I am feeling a little ungrounded. I'm going to make myself, a, uh, I, may, I literally drink two gallons of herbal tea a day and I have no, I offer it. Um, I'm a big believer in zoo pharmacognosy or allowing animals to choose safe substances to self-medicate. I have a bowl of several different varieties of herbal tea out all the time for my animals and they will absolutely go self-medicate when they need it. And that's another option. If you don't want to force an animal to take something, 
offer them safe options, but teas for cats, herbal teas for cats are really a nice way to feel comfortable in offering them adaptogenic herbs in a diluted property that you're never gonna have a problem with. Within that category of adaptogenic herbs, there's a huge dose range. So those powerhouse herbs that I listed, the range is really from one to 10 milligrams per pound of body weight. So if you're nervous, you can start with one milligram. And if you have a dog that is bouncing off the walls and just chews your drywall and cannot ground out, you could move up to the 10 milligram range, uh, you know, for a few days until you can get your animal in a slightly more balanced state of converting to a calming neurogenic response. And so I use a lot of teas for cats because they're safe, kitties accept them, and there's no way you could ever overdose them enough to create a situation that you would be nervous about. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else wanna add to that? Um, I just have one other one that I would add to that, and that would be um, um, on my farm. I used to have a lot of feral cats, and so the, you know they'd have kittens, and there there would be literally no way to catch them. I mean, I'm, I'm on like 20 acres, um, and they would come. You know, I I I when I find, when I first meet them as babies, they would be all goopy in the eyes and you know snotty noses, which you know was a sign of distemper probably, um, I would just put astragalus in their water mm. and they would drink it. And within 24 hours, maybe, maybe 32, they would, they would clear up. It would be completely gone. It just helps them to boost their immune system so that mm -hmm. they can go, they can fight that off on their own. And then they have their mm -hmm. own antibodies. They don't need the, the vaccine for it. And I've used that many, many, many times. Cool. Awesome. Okay. This one's for Rita. Okay. Rita, can fatty lipomas be the cause of stress or can be caused by stress? And if so, how can we help get rid of them? Um, yes, uh, fatty lipomas can be caused by stress for sure. Um, stress brings down the immune system and then that keeps the, you know, and like right now and when people are stressed, it keeps the body in fight or flight. So it activates that sympathetic nervous system. And what you want to do is have that balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And when this happens, the elimination organs, like the lymphatic system, the liver, the kidneys, the digestive system, they all slow down and get really stagnant. And so a lot of times this can allow heat to build up in the body, especially the liver. And so the liver can't process all of that waste and especially the metal uh, metabolic waste and the toxins that you know they're breathing in, they're getting from our homes, they're getting from the outside when they go outside. So this can cause the formation of lipomas. So, um, and especially when dogs are eating foods like kibble, which uh, adds to the toxic load, or when dogs are eating fresh food diets or other supplements or foods that cause detoxification, but the, the toxins are actually being trapped inside the body. Um, I have a lot of uh, raw feeding dogs that get lipomas and people can't figure out, well, you know, I'm doing everything right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't understand. It's because the toxins are trapped. And so the key is to calm the nervous system. The nervous system is always, always, always a component of, of almost all uh, diseases in the body. You want to stimulate the lymphatics and support the liver, the digestive system and the kidney. Um, to slowly bring down fat storage and toxin storage. So you want the liver basically to do its job with the kidneys to get things out, the water soluble and um, um, fat soluble things out of the body. So one of the things that I think is uh, key is, is, is a really neutral substance, which is turkey tail mushroom. Mm -hmm. um, that's gonna help keep those lipomas from getting bigger. Um, and some dogs, you know, got, have like baseball size lipomas and you really want to keep those from getting bigger, especially if they're, uh, intramuscular, uh, you want to keep them small and try to shrink them. So turkey tail mushroom is important. Um, and I know Kaylin uh, said that she was going to give a, ha a, a handout for this. So it is in the handout, but, um, I like to use cleavers and calendula, um, cleavers for dogs that are more on the warm side that uh, really don't like the heat. Uh, they are kind of a hard time regulating their body temperature. And calendula for dogs that are more cool, that love to you know, soak up the sun, they, you know, they just love heat, sleeping under the covers, things like that. 
I like to use calendula for stimulating the lymphatics. And then for dogs that are, again, love the sun, love the heat, um, I like to use self-heal, which is drawing. It draws things out of the body. Um, it helps the kidneys, it's warming, it helps with elimination, and it definitely helps shrink uh, fatty tumors. Um, and I like to combine that um, with ashwagandha, um, which is also an adaptogen. Um, it helps with that stress response. It works really well when combined with self-heal. Um, for dogs that are having a hard time regulating their body temperature, um, they're really, they don't like to be in the, the heat. They don't like to be in the sun, especially because it's summer. Um, I like to use violet, uh, viola odorata, and it's a great lymphatic. It helps dissolve tumors. It clears heat, which is so important for dogs that are warm. Um, it opens up the elimination channels and it's very nourishing. Um, and then chickweed, I combine that with chickweed, which helps regulate fat storage in the body. Um, it helps the digestive system uh, regulate fats and oils. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory. It works with the kidneys. It clears heat, which is a, you know, a signature for dogs that are, are too warm. And it has that liver skin component. So uh, those, those, those can go a long way. Awesome. Rita taught me just a few months ago um, about how to make violet tea. I mean, you, you're like, like Rita, as long as you have a spray free yard, you're an advocate of people harvesting these oh, weeds in, in their backyard. Yeah, you can make a lovely and violet infusion that you can, and violet, actually, that's really good to bring up, Karen. Um, you can use tinctures, but for violet, ex especially violet and things like, um, well, a violet, uh, an infusion actually works a lot better than a tincture. And like things like cleavers. cleavers, cleavers is really sensitive to heat. Okay, so like dried cleavers is almost practically just worthless. And um, so you wanna use cleavers, you do a cold infusion and it's just like making tea. You know, it's just, infusions are just like a really long, sometimes overnight steeped tea. But cleavers works really good in a cold infusion and it also works good as a, a tincture. Um, mm -hmm. Ashwagandha, you can do it digested in the stomach or you can do it as a tincture or a, a, a decoction. So you like simmer the root. Um, and I think uh, I use, I use uh, for stimulating the phatics, I use tinctures of, of calendula and cleavers. And it's such small amount of, of medicine, like for stimulating lymphatics, calendula, like even for, let's just say like, a, um, what's a really big dog, like a bull mastiff or a, a English mastiff, um, literally like five drops twice a day before eating. And, and a, a like, let's do a teacup chihuahua. A teacup chihuahua would be like one single drop or maybe even diluted drop and then take a dropper and give it to a teacup chihuahua. So very little medicine just to really provide stimulation because of the biggest thing with lipomas is that the average American dog and, a, and probably Canadian dog gets less than 15 minutes of exercise a day mm -hmm. because we're so busy. We're so stressed out. We're so busy. Again, our lifestyles are affecting our dogs and our animals and their lymphatics are not being stimulated. If you're a, if you're a Kelpie working your sheep, um, that those lymphatics are getting stimulated all day long. So you don't really have to stimulate the lymphatics, but the average American dog sits in the house a lot. That's I have one other one I would add. Yeah, sure. Please, Dad. Um, because you're dumping so many toxins into the system itself, um, to be able to have a really clean blood system is super important. And red clover is awesome for cleaning the blood. So you yeah, could add that, that into that somehow. Yeah. Yep. So I will just also say that red clover doesn't have an ounce of research pertaining to cats. Um, I know a ton of people use it anecdotally, but that is one that if people say, is there a difference between cats and dogs? There's good information on dogs, but um, I just recently did a full literature search for red clover and kitties. I couldn't find anything. Yeah. So I think people have used it for years, but just as a veterinary perspective, you're not going to find mm -hmm. any, any data on red clover. And yeah, I was thinking more about horses and dogs. Yeah. Um, and Karen, yeah. one of the things that you can do with red clover and cats, even though I don't do cats, um, uh, you can self-select. You can literally go out yeah. outside and clover right now it's all over where i live just get a little dish of clover give it offer it to your cat see if they want to nibble if they don't 
I wouldn't give it to them. You can also like do self selection on the uh, the old catnip. So um, mm. I I am growing some catnip here, and I find that um, the kitties since COVID hit, I have my um. My tea stand has been a popular stopping by stopping grounds for the kitty because they're like, I think I'm going to partake. So <laughs> using catnip as an adaptogen really is something that is, an, I think for kitties, a really nice option. Don't, you know, a kitty, some kitties aren't sensitive to catnip, in which case you can use silver vine. And some kitties aren't sensitive to silver vine or catnip, in which case you can use valerian and valerian root. But usually one of those three natural substances will provide some relief, some tension relief for, for felines. So three options for kitties as well. Nice. Awesome ladies. Thanks. Deb, can you repeat um, your, your protocol that you mentioned for the feral cats real quick, please? Oh, I just, uh, astragalus. Um, I, I always have astragalus tincture on hand because it's just, it's so good when I, uh, if I'm starting to get sick or if I, you know, my dogs have been around another dog that maybe has been sick, it just stimulates the immune system. More of a, more of a balancing of the immune system because it is an adaptogen. It doesn't like make a, a low immune system lower. It will make, it, it will bring it up. To, and so it brings it back into balance. Um, and it's, it's amazing for cats. I've, I've used it, like I said, a ton on cats, but again, I'm not the science guru here dr becker is so you'd have to concur with her so i have a question about saint john's wort for all of the all of my ladies that have massive gardens and actually or you know wildcraft um saint john's wort is fantastic especially for mammals that tend to resonate on with the lower half of the glass where a little bit of maybe that sadness or depression but just mm -hmm. living below the line of superb and so I love St. John's Wort. I use it, I, I call it natural Prozac because if you, mm -hmm. dogs, cats, it's fantastic pick me up for animals that are melancholy, I guess would be yeah. the best description. What do you all think about self selecting St. John's Wort? Absolutely. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And St. John's Wort's one of my, I call my familiars. I absolutely love it. I resonate with that plant. It's, it's blooming right now, it just started blooming last week. And, um, it is so beautiful. The flower essence this is amazing. Um, cats love the flower essence. Um, yeah. I just I just float the flowers in water and then offer it as my cat's water. Um, so my nice. cat definitely is a, a glass half uh, uh, empty kind of cat, and um, uh, he's a Capricorn, and he, you know he's just <laughs> he's a little stoic little guy, <laughs> and and he loves St. John's Wort. So I think it's an excellent idea, Karen. And what about, and Dr. Wilcox, what about for people? What are your thoughts on using things that help keep your glass topped off herbally for people? Mm. Uh, yeah, St. John's wort, um, I don't use that often with people. Um, mostly, I guess I see a lot of chronically ill people, so they're on a lot of medications and yeah. mm -hmm. contraindicated with a lot of medications. Yeah. Um, but the times that I have used it in people, I've definitely seen it have a beautiful effect of just that, that increase in mood. But I, I'm also using it always, usually with adaptogenic herbs, other herbs like yeah. withania or, or rhodiola or um, yeah, Siberian ginseng, all of those to kind of help. Um, but yeah, so that's, I don't really have too much experience with St. John's wort. It's been helpful when I've used it. Yeah. Um, can I just say one thing? Mm -hmm. Um, I work with people as well. Uh, what, um, Dr. Wilcox, is it Dr. Wilcox? Okay. Um, when people are on pharmaceuticals and you would think that St. John's wort actually would help, but you can't use it because it messes. Um, I love to use the flower essence because of those. I find that the emotions that we need to deal with, with people that are very well indicated for St. John's wort, um, you know, kind of like a Dr. Batch, as far as, you know, when you deal with the emotions, some of those physical problems kind of dissipate. So the, the flower essence is a definite, I would say, option there because it does not mess with any of the pharmaceuticals. So I found that it does work for people that cannot use it like physically. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. And, and going back to that for humans, would you mind touching on herbs? We asked Deb this question earlier for, for our horses, but 
What about for ourselves, herbs that can bring peace, calm, and comfort? What sort of things can we introduce, herbs or adaptogens? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that uh, just where I kind of mentioned the herbs that help to um, patch the gas tank, so to speak. Um, so I mentioned motherwort and passion flower last time. Lavender is another beautiful herb that does that. Mm -hmm. It's called, an, these, these herbs are all called alpha sympath, sympatholytics. So essentially they're taking, if you take the fight or flight response, you've got sort of two components to it and it's, it's like the bow and the arrow. So if you're drawing back the arrow on the bow, your body gets really tense. And so everybody right now in COVID, there's this sort of like tense energy that's on the globe. And so this is called your alpha. And then you have the beta, which allows that energy to let go and release. Um, and so with herbs that are alpha sympatholytics, they're going to help reduce that kind of tension and allow you to let go more, um, which motherwort and passionflower, as I mentioned, lavender is probably the number one that's really, really good for that. Um, and a lot of these, and all of these herbs actually also help with sleep. So if you're stressed and you've got insomnia going on, so they're all really helpful for that. Um, California poppy is another really good one as well um it's also used for pain but all, but great for anxiety um chamomile which i mentioned earlier lemon balm is another one there's lots of really great ones lemon lemon's really lemon balm's really great for those that um i love it because i i think of it as well as a bit of a it's it's, it's sort of a throat opener, if you will. You've got your heart opening herbs and your throat opener. Mm. Lemon has this effect that it's, it's helpful for the thyroid. Uh, and it also has great antiviral properties for those people to get really stressed and get, um, you know, herpes or cold sore breakouts, which is very, very common for folks when they're stressed. Uh, lemon's like amazing for that topically or internally. Um, yeah, and it's very great to just calm and relax. Wonderful. Rita, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, in the flower essence realm. Um, and these are for, you know, all of these things that we're talking about definitely can be applied to dogs and people. Like anything I talk about with dogs, I mean, can be people. But um, comfrey flower essence. Um, what a lovely, I mean, it's just a lovely essence. It, it helps, and especially, I mean, for right now, it, comfrey flower essence, um, just like it, it, it knits bones in the body. Um, it helps bring that feeling of safety. And a lot of people aren't feeling safe. They're, they're, you know, they have that, that sense of that, even though, you know, sometimes it's an artificial sense of safety, but they're, they're not feeling safe. And it really helps dogs and people feel safe. It brings together, it helps feel, make you feel more together when everything feels like it's falling apart. So yeah. I really love comfrey flower essence. Um, Bougainvillea, um, Ooh, yeah. uh, Bougainvillea gal galabra, I believe, um, that helps bring the joy back. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very joyful plant and people that struggle with feeling joyful, Bougainvillea is just phenomenal. Um, and then um, I think another one that's really pertinent to now is gorse, uh, Ulex europus, I believe. Um, it, really addresses the long period of grief. And right now, you know, we're, we're going on uh, June and, um, and that long extended period of grief that also has physical and emotional properties. Yeah. That affects us both physically and emotionally. If you feel like you're physically being affected by this, not just emotionally, yeah. I think gorse is really good. And then lastly, uh, mimosa bark. Mimosa bark, um, is uh, mimosa uh, is very good for people that are depressed and it doesn't affect um, the liver pathways like St. John's mm -hmm. wort. Um, mimosa, uh, uh, and mimosa is excellent to mix with motherwort um, just for that really heart, like heart shen, heart calming, heart calming effect, so. Fantastic. I, I, I just wanna add that Rita, I think what you touched on when, when you talked about safety, my perception is that one of the best things we can do for our animals right now, um, animals all, especially prey species like horses, which I know mm -hmm. nothing about, uh, and Deb, you can speak about that, but even our predators in our homes, our dogs and cats, the best, they look to us and what they wanna know first and foremost is, am I safe? Yeah. Yeah. Is the environment safe? Are we safe? 
animals, including us, all have an innate desire to, above, all, above food and water, we have to make sure that we're safe and we need to create an environment where our pets feel safe. And I, to me, the definition of stress for animals is being consistently inconsistent, which mm -hmm. means animals are looking yeah. for us to be a rock to provide safety, emotional, uh, you know, physical safety for us to understand them, um, not for them to understand English, but for us to understand, you know, why they're digging up the carpet, why they just shredded the drywall, why, why are they doing these things? They're not being bad dogs or weird cats. Their behaviors are reflective potentially of not feeling safe. And Dr. Isla Fishburne is going to touch on this because yeah. um, Isla, I think, is the individual in the pet space bringing this concept of how we can intentionally instill the feeling of cellular safety in our animals. It's the most, it's the best gift we can give our animals is having them feel safe and secure in their environment. And, and until that, the best food, the best herbs, the best supplements, none of it matters if our pets don't feel secure in their environment. So Rita, I think you're, you touching on that safety aspect is like the most important thing right now because our pets don't speak fluent English. Uh, they can definitely sense that the world has been flipped upside down. They don't know why. They're not voting and they don't, you know, they don't belong to any party and they're, they don't, they're totally unaware of the civil unrest, but they do know that there is energetic unrest. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can help provide some grounding to them is to make them feel very, very safe in everything that we do. Um, and I, I just want to touch on one more thing and like what, you know, feeling safe, right? I think there's another big component to look at and that is for people and um, for for dogs, and, and let's add the kitties in there, um, is really um, acknowledging your voice. Like, I think about agrimony. Um, agrimony, uh, whether it be a tincture, an herb, or a flower essence, is really, uh, agrimony is really good for that time where, like, we find ourselves holding our breath, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. how many people find themselves, like, you'll be like, I, I'm not breathing. Like, yeah. And also, we put on this right now, because especially if we have families, and sometimes we do it for our dogs, but also like it's the Labrador syndrome, what I call the Labrador syndrome. They're so, some of our dogs are so stoic. They're not going to let you know that anything's wrong because they're trying to be there for you. Agrimony is when you put on that fake facade and act like everything's okay. Mm. And when someone asks you, are you okay? Oh, yeah, everything's fine. I'm great. I'm great but not speaking our truth to make other people feel better and mm. so that they can feel better. And when you say, well, you know, how are you doing? And you might not, I mean, have the worst, I had one of the worst days on Monday and like, you know, keeping that all in right now in this world is not, it doesn't serve us and it doesn't serve our dogs, but like agrimony is really when we hold back and try to make other people feel better. Um, I think our dogs do that as well. And our animals do that. And I think um, agrimony flower essence or agrimony as just like, maybe like uh, kind of like spirit dosing um, uh, where you just take a couple drops, just a couple drops a day can really help bring out our voices and help us be authentic. Because I, what Karen said um, and, and, and my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Fishburn, you know, at a cellular level, we need to be grounded and we need to have, cur you know, and these are the times when we find our strength. And mm -hmm. our dogs find a lot of our, their strength through us mm -hmm. and we have to be authentic. And I think be, and that may be that we're having a terrible time with this. Mm -hmm. Like we're the, maybe we're the type of personality that just feels really afraid all the time. But yeah. at least by saying that we can take back our power and yeah. agrimony can help with that. I have a question for Dr. Wilcox about human breathing. I have just um, recently, so I'm a big Wim Hof girl. And so I Wim Hof, all the time, just because I find myself holding my breath. So Wim, W-I-M-H-O-F. He is a guy that teaches a, a breathing technique. He, you can go on YouTube and learn. It takes, you know, 30 seconds, but it's a great way to intention, stop shallow stress breathing and really like, sometimes I find myself that I don't think I'm stressed, but I'm like, why can't I take a really deep breath? And it's because my body has converted to sympathetic fight or flight. And I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of it. I was like, gosh, I can't catch my breath. So I Wim Hof every morning and I Wim Hof every night. Dr. Wilcox, do you like, what do you, do, what breathing techniques would you say that people could do to help calm themselves down um, that maybe they're, they're unaware of? 
That's a great question. I think that um, I'm a big fan actually of Wim Hof. So I will get, uh, I'll, I'll get people to go to his website or check him out on yeah. YouTube. Um, I think just, you know, first is just even paying attention to that. So we've all kind of heard of deep breathing, belly breathing. Um, there's something about his, he's doing a lot of research now with, with many different universities and the technique he has, you know, is really um, helpful for if you're thinking it from, even from the perspective of what's going on in our chest area. So our heart and our lungs, and we have our, our lungs, which are associated with grief, sadness, and loss, and our heart, which is also associated with sadness and depression and confusion. And so to kind of open that up, whenever we're doing any kind of deep breathing, so expanding, making sure our chest elevates, but also our belly, um, these are, are both really helpful for stimulating what's called our vagus nerve. And our vagus nerve will basically tell our system like, oh, we're actually not stressed right now. So deep breathing of any kind is, is really, really helpful for just telling our brain, yes, we're, not, we're no longer stressed. We're not running away from a bear because we're deep breathing right now. Mm -hmm. um, Wim Hof is great. And uh, there's many kind of different techniques. I generally, like in practice, will tell people either to do his technique or just teach them how to deep belly breathe. Um, mm -hmm. And putting, you know, even just putting your hand on your belly and making sure that it's rising because a lot of times it's not even doing that for people. And that gives you you know, even just taking a moment or two and just kind of setting in and noticing. And as you said, Dr. Becker, like if you're all of a sudden realizing throughout the day that you're really shallow breathing, you want to take a moment and you want to take some deep breaths. Emotional freedom technique is great to also do at that point um, to check in as to maybe why you're feeling that way. Um, but yeah, deep breathing is great. And I've had a lot of people will mention too, and I, I don't know if you found this, Dr. Becker, but um, when they're doing deep breathing, uh, especially Wim Hof techniques where you're kind of doing a few rounds of it, uh, rounds of deep breathing or intense breathing, uh, you're allowing grief to come out. And so people will tell me, yes, I started crying all of a sudden. I felt yep. fine. And then I started breathing and all of a sudden I was bawling my eyes out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a really kind of beautiful way to exercise those muscles literally to get out that, that emotion that gets stuck in there. Yeah. Yeah. I have one thing I would add. Um, when, when practicing deep breathing, put your hand on your stomach and on your chest and make sure that your stomach rises a couple of seconds before your chest actually does. Because uh, it's really hard to, sometimes it's hard for people to, to even notice which is going first. But if your stomach goes just a couple seconds before your chest, but then also be aware that if your diaphragm is tight, you're not yeah. going to be able to get air down into your, yep. into your lower part of your, your lungs. It, it just won't expand. And so there's a lot of um, you know, pressure techniques, muscle energy technique, techniques that you can use to try to get your, your diaphragm unstressed. And that's one of the things for me, especially, it, when I'm stressed, I know it because my diaphragm will not let me have a deep breath. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Totally. Incredible what our, our body, if we just listen, is, mm -hmm. is willing to show us. Yeah. I've got a question here. It's from Jackie Goland and a few others also asked, what role does candida or gut imbalance play in stress? And what are the best herbs to naturally, safely, and effectively manage this overgrowth? Who, who would like to start this one? I will. Go ahead, Deb, please. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess the, the first thing I would, I would mention is um, caprylic acid, naturally cap um, occurring caprylic acid, which is in uh, like uh, coconut oil, MCT, medium chain trig triglycerides. Um, it's excellent for getting rid of, of the candida overgrowth. Obviously, it's, it's a diet change. You have to stay away from things that are going to cause a, that, that cause sugar overloads in the gut system, like fresh fruits. I mean, there, there are certain fruits that aren't as sweet as other ones, but even though it's a, it's a fruit, it still becomes sugar in the, in the gut system, and then it actually feeds the, the yeast and makes it worse. Um, Podiarco is amazing for, for getting rid of um, candida, but I also, I'm, I'm kind of of the school of, you know, I like to blend I, I like different, adding different herbs to a, a concoction rather than just giving one, because I think that as the herb 
field works. And if you think back, you know, through history of animals that do self-medicate, you know, they, they don't just eat one plant. They, they, they eat one plant and then like my horse, she eats, a, she eats the whole comfrey bush and then she goes out and digs dandelion roots. So it, it's, it's like you have to have, you have to have one herb that will, will help the other herb that helps another herb that helps another herb so that it, it, you get a synergistic blend of, of things that actually can create a, 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 the perfect environment to heal. Um, so plantain is also really good for just kind of soothing the gut system. Um, obviously, slippery elm can, what, what attaches itself to the gut lining and can actually help it to heal behind it so that things can kind of slide through without stopping and, and, and taking hold. Um, um, I had one more and I just, <laughs> sorry, my cheat sheet. Olive leaf. Olive leaf was another one that I, I, I absolutely love for candida and yeast overgrowth. So like I said, getting rid of starchy, starchy root vegetables or having at least the enzymes to be able to help the, the dog, or you know, most people don't give starchy root vegetables to cats, and I'm not really sure that cats get a whole lot of, of the candida like the dogs do. But you know, when, you, when they're fed starchy root vegetables and they don't have the correct digestive enzymes to break them down, it just sets up a, a perfect storm in the gut system for them to be able to you know, get a, a yeast overgrowth, and then it just ex explodes into a whole other bunch of stuff. <laughs> uh, I'll just I'll just throw in there that for for dogs, humans, uh, the yeast, the opportunistic fungus that tends to take over in humans is Candida albicans. For dogs, it's Malasthesia. So it's a different mm -hmm. species, but it still is an opportunistic yeast. It still flourishes. It loves sugar. It still flourishes when the opportunity is there, and it still is on a seesaw. Um, in terms of a functional strong immune system, all of us, all of our pets have yes. a little bit of yeast, but when cortisol specifically, so yes, you need to fix the diet. So if you're feeding a diet that is supportive of yeast, you could have an easy yeast overgrowth. But during these trying times, when stress is off the charts, I have seen animals on beautiful species appropriate diets still have flare ups of malassezia, itchy red swollen paws, e chronic ear infections, even mm -hmm. um, tear staining with secondary yeast, uh, moist dermatitis around the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, not uncommon because of excessive cortisol. And cortisol is produced by our, our, all of our adrenal glands and our pet's adrenal glands to help us deal with stress. But there again, when it comes to the adaptogenic aspects, a little bit of cortisol we all need. Too much cortisol is what starts us into this, pa this pattern of not being able to cope with stress and you you know everyone knows that good there's such a thing as good stress like exercise but chronic low grade stress which is what's happening now with how the world is that's where it starts to become immunosuppressive so ashwagandha is actually one of those herbs that in i think 2000 uh, a review of monkeys cats dogs uh, showed that it was anti-inflammatory anti-tumorigenic immunomodulating and an antioxidant but also had partial covering for opportunistic fungus so if you if you mm. do have an animal that is has no dietary issues and the diet squared away but has recently had uh, a, a surge of opportunistic yeast then you could consider the adaptogenic herb ashwagandha to kind of cover your bases mm -hmm. good one awesome karen thanks to piggyback off of that rochelle I have a question uh, for the kids in the back. What does what does yeast look like for humans? What I don't know. Mm, um, Is that a concern? Uh, well, I think mostly for humans, the way that uh, people mostly think of it is with vaginal yeast infections is the number one. Um, but it's often it can be skin issues. It can be like eczema type of picture. Um, anything that's kind of like under the arms, under the breast, in the groin area. Um, sinus, so sinuses are another big one. If you have chronic sinus issues, that can be a yeast issue as well. Uh, itchy bum, itchy anywhere kind of, can be a high histamine and or a yeasty type of a pitcher. Um, yeah, those are the, the big ones I would think of. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move us right along here. Angela asked, and she'd love to know, if you could choose one resource for herbs and adaptogens, like in our mm -hmm. companion animals or ourselves, 
what would it be? A, a link, a book, something along those lines. What would it, what would it be? Dr. Becker, do you hmm. want to start this one? I will, but actually let me go pull it off my bookshelf because right I, I can do show and tell. One awesome. minute. Awesome. <laughs> who else, who else wants to go in the hot seat? Um, I, like for people that are just starting out, mm -hmm. um, I think Greg Tilford's Herbs for Pets is a really good uh, reference. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, I think that that's, if, if you, you and should yeah, definitely if start yeah, with that as a resource. <laughs> if, you're just, if you're just starting out, you know, Greg's an amazing herbalist. Um, if you're just starting out, it's a really good basic amazing. understanding. It's a amazing. Good one. Yeah. It's and he's really got good. A, he's got a, it's a, he's got a small one now. I have it. I yeah. actually have it in my other office. He has a yeah. small one now that's much easier yeah. to uh, yes. and the, manhandle and than the, that big sucker that you got. <laughs> and well, I this is my Greg's desk book. reference. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I love Greg's because it has pictures. And I just really, I just really like, I just really like that it's, it shows you, especially if you're going to wildcraft, it shows you, which I love. Barbara Fougere, uh, and it has a, has a veterinary botanical herbal reference that is um, too heavy to ship. Um, but the other layman um, resource would be Carolyn Ingraham's Animal Self-Medication. And I, this book is, is thick, but I like it because there again, it starts with um, layman options and gives you, uh, and gives you, thank you, it, layman options. And um, I'm refilling my teapot, no worries. It, it tells you where to start when it comes to self-medication. And it also allows you to have flower essence options, essential oil options, herbal options for the potential of self-medication. So I, I like Carolyn Ingraham's self-medication book as a nice starter too. Dr. Rochelle, I saw you get up. Did you go to grab a, a guide too to share? Uh, just as uh, it's a really, oh, actually, I thought I grabbed two and I didn't grab the right one. Um, where is it? Um, maybe somebody else can go first and I'll try to find it. Yeah, and absolutely. We've got, so we've already got Greg Tilford's Guide for Pets. And Rita, you said he also has a smaller one. It's the same book, but it's just condensed. Herbs, for, herbs for Pets. It's yeah, called herbs for, herbs, pets. herbs for Pets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then Karen... Oh, we've got the link there for Karen, uh, Caroline Ingram's book. The link's in the chat. Did you find it, Dr. Thank Wilcox? You. I did, yes. I don't actually have, like, all of my herbal books are, they're not specific for adaptogen herbs. I can't think of one book off the top of my head that's yeah. for that. Um, but probably, like, a really old book that's very common, and a lot of people know about it, uh, but it's an old favorite of mine. It's the uh, adrenal, fatigue. adrenal fatigue. Yeah. So this one's really good by James Wilson. And it just really goes through everything just to get you, to, just to understand really what adrenal fatigue is and what stress, what stress does to our body. So it's a, it's a great read if anybody's interested. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies, for, for sharing that. So Deb, I know you talked about liking to combine herbs. But uh -huh. quite, a, quite a few of our attendees did write in and they wanted to know, like, if you had to choose one, what would it be? Herb for stress management. Mm. And I wonder if all you ladies are going to agree on the same one or if you mm. want to all Prob choose a Probably one. not, because I would get in trouble if I told you mine. <laughs> because it's comfrey. <laughs> and they're yeah, so... It, they're it's so internal. Comfrey got so much bad press back in the day because it works, a, it, it just works too well. And um, I love it. I, it it's, you, you can spin it off in, in, in any direction. And it just, it, it's such a compatible herb with, with almost every other herb that I use. It, it, I love it. Um, I guess if I had to have a second one, it would be astragalus. And astragalus is, like I said, it's an immune modulator. It's an adaptogen. And I, I use it on a daily basis. Awesome. Well, six, six days a week. Rita, what do you got in, in your uh, back pocket? Um, well, to choose just one, but um, it's hard. Um, I guess for me, be, it would definitely be, it would go between nettles and I mean for strengthening and health and and definitely stress. But milky oats, which um, is a venus a sativa, um, sativa. Mm -hmm. it, Milky oats is what is called a, like a trophorestorative, which is an herb that restores nourishment to the body. Um, 
It helps with the nervous system. It's really great for adrenal exhaustion and chronic fatigue. So um, it also is helpful for anxiety and depression and overwhelm and insomnia. Um, I really love milky oats. Um, but then ashwagandha and nettles, that, like the three of them I, I really love. And I love, love, love comfrey flower essence. And uh -huh. Deb loves comfrey and I love comfrey flower. For dogs, I love comfrey flower essence a lot. Uh -huh. Awesome. Dr. Rochelle? Uh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the time of yeah. the year. Right now, uh, my three favorites are uh, Cordyceps, Japanese knotweed, and withania. Um, and I think that uh, withania, for all the, uh, also called ashwagandha, uh, for all the reasons that we've already mentioned today, um, that and cordyceps, they just have this, cordyceps is a mushroom and it just has this beautiful immune boosting property to it. But both of those two herbs combined are just, are so great if you're coming out of this complete exhaustion um, and debility and they just really kind of help to really strengthen you. Um, so I think they're great foundational herbs to use together. And Japanese knotweed is just so, it has a lot of reservatrol in it. Um, it's great antioxidant and really great anti-inflammatory for the body, for the brain, the joints, everything. Um, yeah, so it's got a lot of great, and it helps to open up all the uh, meridians in the body, the, the Chinese medicine meridians in the body. So Japanese knotweed's a little bit like licorice because you put licorice in every combination and just helps everything to work better. So mm -hmm. just um, I think of Japanese knotweed a little bit the same as that. So, and, and awesome. Nebula, if I mention that, they're all my favorite. I love them all. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Dr. Becker, um, excuse me. Dr. Becker, what do you have for us? Such a, such a tough choice. But for me, I, part of it is like, I think the, the magic of medicine is matching the right herb to the right patient. So for instance, like L-theanine, a 2015 study for L-theanine, which is the calming aspect in uh, calming aspects of herbal tea. Um, a 2015 storm sensitivity uh, research done on dogs showed that panting, pacing, and hiding were all, owners reported a 94% improvement with using L-theanine. So I would say for like sound hypersensitivity, I would definitely do L-theanine. However, if I had to pick one adaptogenic herb for like a lifetime. And that's the other thing that we might want to touch on. When you supply adaptogens, well, I think most of us in the group would agree, you don't put your patient or you don't take it forever. You want to take it and then cycle off. So, you know, during stress, you take it. And when you're doing better, you don't. And if you have a lifetime of stress, then you need to rotate them. And we'll get more uh -huh. up from that from Dr. Wilcox in a minute. But I'm a big believer in not staying on something forever. So use it when uh -huh. you need it and then come off of it. But I would have to pick actually turmeric believe it or not, a 2015 study of turmeric said that it reduced anxiety across all species, different amounts, but um, there again, rats, dogs, cats, horses, humans. Turmeric has not only anti-cancer, anti anti-inflammatory, antioxidant properties, amazing for the gut, but it actually plays into um, neurochemical synapses and reducing inflammation in the brain, which makes the brain function better. So believe, if I had to pick one if I was stranded on the island with one thing, I would probably pick turmeric. But, but Dr. Wilcox, do you want to, how do you, for people, how do you recommend adaptogenic herbs? Because it's something that, I mean, some people say, listen, I was born stressed and these things help, but I don't want to come off of it. What, what's your thought on the body's adapting to the same thing coming in? And maybe it's not as effective in six months or a year. Mm, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think it's nice to have that sort of stimuli because it's kind of like if you scratch your arm, if I start scratching somebody's arm right away, they're going to be like, okay, maybe that feels nice or, or it's annoying after a while. And then after, you know, an hour or two, if you keep doing it, you're not even going to recognize you're doing it anymore. So it's the same with the body. I think of it like if you're always giving it the same thing day in, day out, after a while, the body just almost becomes like immune or ignores it and it needs to be re-stimulated by something. So there's, you know, I think with different herbs, it's a bit different with, but with adaptogenic herbs, generally, I think of it like, if you're looking at uh, a bit from sort of three different perspectives. So you've got um, somebody that's like has a lot of stress, a lot of adrenal fatigue, you want to give them the whole kit and caboodle, you want to give them the nutrients that are going to help for their adrenals, you know, B vitamins, magnesium, especially B5, magnesium, vitamin C, 
and you want to give them uh, herbs and potentially even glandulars. And that would be like the go-to of like, okay, you're really stressed, we'll give you everything. Um, and that would be, the, you know, you stay on that for a little while till things become mitigated and balanced. And then you kind of wean off of that and you'd wean off of the glandulars first. So then you're just on the herbs and the nutrients. And that might be a month to two to three to six, depending on really what's going on. And as you said, if somebody's always stressed, then you're going to keep them on certain things for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, if they're doing well, you know, you get off the herbs and then you're just on the nutrients and then you're dealing with the food and then you get off the nutrients and you're hopefully yeah. Whole, okay. whole food diet and, and feeling well. Um, but yes, I would say with herbs, generally, I like to rotate, you know, every six, six to 12 weeks, it really kind of depends on how well somebody's doing. But uh, like, uh, back to ashwagandha, I mean, people take have taken that daily, like in India, it's been used for 3000 years, like, yeah. it's an incredible herb that, you know, yeah. people, you know, if you're low dosing it every day, um, I think I, I think there can be a lot of benefit to that. But I, yeah. I do like to stop people and then, and then reset and kind of see how their body responds to yeah. it. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, so I drink Tulsi, which is holy basil, which is one of these adaptogenic herbs. I drink, I have consumed a pot of Tulsi tea since my twenties and I just, I probably should rotate, but I just kind of like how it tastes more so. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are some things in small quantities that our bodies maybe probably do get adapted to, but aren't necessarily harmful. I do have to say the proactive veterinarian will well up in me. And I do have to say this, adaptogenic herbs are the safest option right now, much more so than chemical alternatives, you know, sedatives or quaaludes or, uh, or other, other pharmacologic agents that uh, we sometimes have to reach for and sometimes are necessary. These herbs can also be used as we taper animals off of drugs, helping to manage behavior or stress anxiety issues. You can use the hybrid protocol of using some pharmacologic agents and some herbal nutraceuticals to help manage our really stressed patients. But the one thing that does not come in pill form that binds cortisol more than anything on the planet is movement ther therapy, exercise. So I wish I could say, you can give all these awesome herbs that these amazing healers have mentioned. And if, you're, if your pet is chucking cortisol from a stress response, there is no magic pill that sucks up cortisol better than moving your pet's body. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. use these suggestions with <laughs> um, daily, you see, yeah, daily. I've been sitting here long enough that I need to move my body. I'm starting and, to move my and, chair. <laughs> exactly. And so, and as Rita says, you know, it, it, that'll help with the lymphatics and that will binds cortisol and moves lymphatics and improves brain chemistry and improves olfactory input. There's all these amazing things that you can't get from any pill powder, tincture, salve, or ointment that just have to come through physically moving. So I have to throw that in. Totally agree. Yeah, totally and also agree. there's also the uh, I can do it for my dog, but I can't do it for myself factor. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Isla and I have been uh, discussing, um, or Dr. Fishburne and I have been discussing, you know, like uh, treat yourself like your dog. Um, yeah. Because there's lots of people who are like, well, I, 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 you know, I don't exercise, but they'll do anything for their dog. So if you can't find the, the gumption to get out there and move, um, yeah. know that your dog needs to move. Even if it's at its own pace, get out there and take a walk with your dog. It's one of the most amazing things that, you know, that I do is like just yeah. spend time with me and my pup. And, and that's what been one of the major themes of today is let's take care of our animals, but let's stop forgetting about ourselves. You know, yeah, it's a, Dr. Isla was saying, it's that harmonious movement from us to them. We really have to take care of ourselves as well mm -hmm. we're important too um I, I have one 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 thought if i have if we have just a couple minutes absolutely um i've learned so much from my dogs through this period and i'm blessed to live in northwest montana at the end of the road going nowhere i have a half a mile driveway and when i go home at night they come to work with me every day so they're they don't have that kind of stress they they have a whole office full of aunties that take care of them all day long they love coming to work. They're so social. But I have my challenge girl who is part um, border collie. And she's the most independent dog I've ever known. And she's, she's been my biggest teacher because she has to have her freedom. 
And so when I drive in my driveway, I let them out at the end of the driveway and her and, and my guy take off running and they run the whole way home. And she runs like a quarter horse, just boom, 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 boom. And he runs like secretariat. And he just like pushes by her. But then she, you know, she's, she's gotten to the point where before, when I let her out, she would come home maybe two or three hours later, but she never left the property. She was always hanging out, sniffing and doing her thing. Now she comes in before he does because she has that freedom and she knows exactly what is going to happen. She's going to be able to do it again tomorrow. And it's been phenomenal for her and for me. But I mean, I'm used to German shepherds who are like right at my heel all day long. They don't leave. They want to stay. They're loyal. They're like, what do you need? And what do you need? What do you need? And she's like, I don't care what you need. I know what I need. And so she's taught me to be able to follow her lead and go, okay, well, I know what I need. And I, I, I'll take a walk and they'll either come with me or they won't. But it's, she, they're such great teachers if we just let them talk in their, you know, in their way. Their, their speak is different than ours, obviously, but they can tell us volumes. And even, on, e even on that, Deb, it's, you know, we're good teachers. We're great teachers. We can help ourselves, right? So taking that time to kind of silence ourselves, our mind, and realize what it is that we need. If we need that walk, if we need to go to bed earlier, um, if we need to have a meal, if we need to skip a meal, whatever it is for ourselves, it's a good idea to take that time too. Because we know, yeah. inside, we know. We do. <laughs> and we can't ignore it because you know, we've, we've been working with, with animal people for so long that you know, we, we understand that when they start seeing improvement in their animal, they go, oh, that really worked. Well, that worked for me too. And it's like, yeah, bingo. That was sort of sneaking in the back door going, watch this. And it works every time. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. Really quick before we wrap up, um, any recommendations of sources for flower essences? The Flower what? Essence Society is really good. Great. The Flower F -E -S. Essence Society. Yeah, the Flower Essence Society. Awesome. And Karen, if you don't mind, there was someone asking which teas, could you go over the teas again that you share with your sure, cats? Sure, sure. So first of all, I, I am neurotic about the organic aspect because mm -hmm. tea is one of those heavily sprayed pesticide laden raw materials. So really, truly, I'm at the point where there's some things you don't have to go organic on at all but tea is not one of them. That is a hard stop for me. So I really believe we need to be only purchasing organic teas. And so for kitties, I will do, and dogs, chamomile, Tulsi, which is also called holy Indian holy basil. And there again, I grow that in my herb garden, but I also just buy it as loose leaf. Um, and then passion flower. So chamomile, passion flower, hops, Cava Cava, Valerian tea, Rhodiola, you know, L-theanine is the component in these teas that is a calming effect. Um, but any of those herbal blends that you can buy, like Sleepy Time tea for humans, you can totally brew and make cool and offer it to your dogs, cats, and horses too. Uh -huh. Deb, do you ever use, do you use teas with, and there again, I'm sure everyone knows, it's always cooled teas. Mm -hmm. So you don't give anything hot. Yeah. Uh, do you use tea with horses? I do. I actually use it. Um, I, I pour it in their like their grain or whatever they're having for dinner, um, depending on what's going on. I've I've got you know some some favorites that I will use just depending on what they're telling me today. Um, if I'm if I'm training because I'm a I'm an endurance rider, and so if I'm you know if, if I'm training and I know that my horse has really worked really hard and and, and just needs a little bit of extra comfort tonight i'll add some herbs into it you know do a, a tea with that yeah. but it's 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 so much easier for them but horses love herbs you know they yeah. they will lick it right yeah. out of your hand if it's something that they think that they need in their you know, their self-care kind of thing well and i will say that you um like if, if you are feeding dehydrated or freeze-dried food to dogs and cats and if you would normally be using water to reconstitute your use tea. food yeah. use tea and yeah. you can, and in my house, I, I make organic bone broth and then I mix the tea while, while, the, while the bone broth is cooling off. I have, I make mine in a ninja. So I make bone broth in my ninja. I open the lid and then I just throw a bunch of tea bags in there and then it becomes oh, perfect. tea infused bone broth. And then I can oh, put it in ice, perfect. ice cube trays, freeze it for the dogs. You know, it's a nice, I'm in Arizona. It's hot. 
So we do a lot of uh, calming ice cubes, but you can, uh, there again, because their bone broth is hiding it, I, you can drizzle it over kitties' dry food. My kitties eat raw food, but they still get uh, herbal infused bone broth for the calming effects. So there are ways you can sneak it into kitties. And there again, you can start with a with a light infusion, you know, just like how some people like their tea extra steep and some people like very weak tea. You can start with weak teas for kitties and mm -hmm. move up if you have a really reactive dog that you're looking to get uh, more polyphenols and the constituents into, you can do more of an infusion or an intense stronger tea. But if you mm -hmm. mix it with bone broth, it's a great way to hide some of the, the, the aggressive flavors. Like valerian tea tastes like an old woman's chew, at least in oh, my yeah. opinion. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you mix valerian <laughs> with bone broth, I mean, yeah. I have the finickiest cats in the world. And they're like, okay. So there are ways you can, bone broth covers a lot of punk Yes, ease. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good advice. Really good advice. Awesome, ladies. Thank you so much. This has been super helpful. We've got a ton of resources to go check out. And it's going to be a lot easier to move forward and help ourselves and our pets manage our stress. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and I'll put the link to the next session in the chat. Thank awesome. you. Th Thanks, Thanks ladies. Thanks for doing this. Take thank care you everybody. Bye-bye. So bye. 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 bye.